After purifying your component of interest from the cell, you're either going to assay its function, quantify it, or probe its structure. Molecular function is either binding or catalysis. Here we deal with the assay of catalytic function. Here is a simple example. We encode the FOA gene with a C-terminal his tag on a plasmid and put it in the cell. This results in production of FOA protein, which we purify by nickel NTA chromatography. We then perform an enzymatic assay. We add the chromogenic substrate paranitrophenyl phosphate, which gets hydrolyzed to paranitrophenol, which is yellow. The color is easily quantified by, pho pho by photometry. By monitoring the formation of color over time with different amounts of substrate, we can calculate parameters such as KCAT and KM for the enzyme. However, most enzymes aren't amenable to simple colorimetric assays. For example, suppose we wish to monitor methylation by caffeine synthase. This molecule isn't detectable by photometry, and thus more sophisticated analytical methods are required. The workhorse method for such analyses is LCMS or GCMS. Here you perform an extraction of the small molecules in your sample, and then run them through a column to separate them typically based on their hydrophobicity. As the molecules emerge from the end of the column, they are ionized and separated by mass spectrometry. From the resulting spectrum, the molecule you wish to quantify can be identified from its mass. Another way to monitor the course of an enzymatic reaction is an enzyme-coupled assay. Here you mix another enzyme in with the one you're trying to monitor. In this example, they are monitoring the enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. When this enzyme performs its reaction, it consumes NADP+. The enzyme diaphorase, which is the enzyme being mixed in, uses the NADPH generated from the monitored reaction to reduce resazurin resulting in a fluorescent dye. That dye can be quantified by fluorometric methods. These assays exist to monitor not only NADPH formation, but also NADH, phosphate, and inorganic pyrophosphate, amongst a few others. Though they are disfavored due to the dangers of working with radiation and the associated logistics and bureaucracy of such work, radiation-based assays are powerful tools for monitoring biochemical reactions. Suppose I want to monitor this reaction that consumes ATP. I can purchase radioactive ATP that is labeled with an alpha position with 32P. If I dope some of this reagent into my reaction, it will be hydrolyzed to ADP. I then separate the molecules in my sample by thin layer chromatography. Like other chromatography methods we have encountered, this one uses a stationary phase typically composed of silica gel. You place one end of the plate in a solvent and allow it to soak into the plate. As the solvent spreads through the plate, it will separate the compounds along the vertical axis of the plate. Thus the ADP and ADP will separate, making bands. By placing the plate on a piece of radiation-sensitive film, you get an image of where the radioactive compounds came out. Based on the density of the bands, you can calculate the degree of chemical conversion. Monitoring enzymatic reactions on large molecules such as nucleic acids or proteins is often challenging. For example, let's say you want to monitor the amino acylation of a tRNA by amino acyl tRNA synthetases. First you would purify the synthetase, probably with a histag purification. In this case, the protein is the M. Janashi tyrosine synthetase, and we want to quantify whether this synthetase accepts E. coli total tRNA as a substrate. We purchase tritium-labeled tyrosine. You can buy radioactive versions of many of the common metabolites and cofactors, and all the amino acids are available. You will incubate the tRNA sample, the synthetase sample, ADP, and hot tyrosine in a reaction. The tritium labeled tyrosine becomes covalently attached to the 3' end of the tRNA if the reaction occurs. After incubation, we transfer the reaction to a piece of filter paper that has been soaked in trichloroacetic acid and then dried out. The acidity will quickly denature the sample and cause the tRNA and protein to precipitate in the paper. So now the reaction is quenched and all the molecules are in the paper. We then soak the filters in 10% TCA. Unreacted hot tyrosine diffuses out of the paper, but the proteins and tRNAs stay behind. After several washes, we soak the paper in ethanol to remove water, then dry it out fully with ether. We then place the filter in a vial and quantify the radioactivity 
with a scintillation counter. We can then calculate how much of the hot tyrosine remains on the filter and from this quantify the conversion during the reaction. Another common reagent is gamma 32 p ATP. Amongst other uses, it is great for monitoring kinase reactions. Whenever the recipient molecule is a polymer, you can detect its labeling using the filter binding assay. So gamma 32 p filter binding assays can be used to watch kinases that phosphorylate proteins. Many assays will involve body labeling a nucleic acid with radioactivity. This is done by doping in alpha 32 p labeled NTPs or DNTPs during synthesis of the nucleic acid. The radioactivity will then cause the bands to light up after separation on a page or agarose gel. Other common radioactive probes are I-131 labeled proteins and radioactive acetyl-CoA.